Some games are not designed to be year-long journeys. Sometimes it's better to have a really tight game that offers a lot of variety and provides space for tons of replayability. This week, join me, Zach Walsh, as I talk with Jason Van Hee about his new game, Strange Hills, a game inspired by classics like Mad Max and Dark Sun. This trip will take you on a walk that shows you what it means to be evil and changing your tune. We talk art, advice, and how to support the people who were here before you. Welcome to Schedule for Launch, a podcast to discover projects that you may have missed. This week I am very excited to be talking about a really interesting game that really doesn't have that much longer on Kickstarter, and I'm here with the developer, Jason. Jason, thank you for coming on the show this week. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here, Zach. We're going to be talking about Strange Hills today, and this, I, I was saying to you before that we actually started, before we actually started, wow, sentences. Right. <laughs> uh, I love <laughs> I love the art for this game, and it's very uh-huh. easy to get the tone that you're going for. So I'm excited to pick your brain on that just a little bit. Um, uh, the, the art was really important for the game, so I would love to have my brain picked. Excellent. All right, well, before we dive any deeper, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Jason Van Hee, and I live in Seattle, and... Um... I have been a gamer for more than 40 years. I, I started with the old Holmes Blue Box D&D. It wasn't even basic D&D yet. It was before there was such a conception, um, which was supposed to teach you how to play so that you could then play advanced D&D, but that, that <laughs> never coordinated well. And uh, the Holmes book and box is, is mostly forgotten these days, but... I've uh, I've been a, a most often game master for like the last thirty of those years. Oof, um, that's a pain and, I understand. Yeah, <laughs> it's I mean it's fun, but sometimes oh, it's very you, fun. you want to change. But I spent a lot of that time <laughs> making worlds and making homebrew rules for various games. And in the last five or seven years, I've really worked on building a bunch of games. But Strange Hills is the first one where I'm very excited to have it done and and show it off to people and and present it this is the first time i've been like okay wow this is great this is the one and rightfully so like like i said the tone for it is it's right in your face and you know exactly what you're getting into at least setting wise yeah what is strange hills though what is Strange Hills? So Strange Hills is a no dice, no masters game, uh, which means it has no game master. It's it's a cooperative player game. It also has no dice. So there's really no randomizing elements. There's just a story being told between the group of players. And they are people who used to be part of an oppressive regime in the last city left on a dying world. And the ruler of that city, the dreaded Witch Queen, died. And now everyone has to flee and try and find some place to be because that last place, home, is dying also. So you, the group, uh, the, the players, are all a collection of people who used to be operatives in an evil regime and are now in caravans traveling across the wastelands looking for some place, any place, that might still have a trace of life that the witch queen didn't drain the life from or destroy with her armies or that didn't just get wiped out on its own. Wow. And and the, the whole goal and purpose of the game is you are these awful people and can you manage to not be awful? Can you become redeemed um, a little at least? Can you become a better person? in what are probably your last days? Or will you just rely on the same sorts of oppressive, dark, vile, violent lifestyle and techniques you formerly used when you were part of the oppressive regime? Because you have regular people with you too who fled the city thinking maybe you would protect them or might need them or maybe they're your family or or your former hangers-on and flunkies. And so... Do you continue to abuse and misuse these people? 
or do you see that in these last moments maybe you have a chance to be a better person maybe you can realize why what you were doing was wrong and maybe you can become better so that's kind of the core idea of the game is faced with the end of everything you knew can you become a better person again that's really deep and heavy and i think a lot of people can appreciate that right now oh my yeah. gosh <laughs> Um, it, I can't say that it doesn't at least resonate slightly with the world that we're living in now. <laughs> uh, you know, I started writing it, I came up with the name for it, which was originally longer and it doesn't matter, but, uh, I came up with the name for it about a year, uh, last October. So about 10 months ago now. And then I didn't have, I didn't do anything with it. I just had said, oh, here's a name. And then here's kind of a loose concept. Uh, and then... Round about January, February, I really started writing on it and just pounded away at it for a couple of months. And then suddenly there was this game. But we talked, well, you mentioned a little bit about the art right at the beginning. And yes. One of the things that I wanted to do was start thinking about the art early because I wanted this to be something serious, right? Mm -hmm. You can't kickstart now. You can't produce a game now you can't can't hold your head up high in game development <laughs> if you aren't getting some nice art in there right you know you oh, have yeah. to like you have to showcase something and so i was uh i was talking on a discord that i'm on um about hey i kind of want to start getting some art and someone on there said oh you should talk to my friend juan and i said okay maybe i will and then I decided to just do it that night because I thought, <laughs> well, the idea is in my head now. Why don't I just get a hold of this guy immediately? So um, one of my artists, uh, the one who does the cover art, which is the color piece that you can yes. see when you go to the, the page with the person facing at you, um, that's uh, Wanachoa. And he is a Colombian artist and a longtime gamer. And he does amazing work very quickly, and he's super collaborative, and I cannot praise him enough. Um, he also did several of the pieces on the Kickstarter, so like the Hard Rain Falling and the Segmented Worm. Those were his pieces oh, also. The Segmented Worm is so cool. It's, I, it was I the, love that piece so much. So that was the first piece we actually started working on when we were talking um, I, so, uh, the, the, the game has a series of, of different elements that you can bring into play. So some of them are setting elements, like, um, like the rain is, is a setting element. Um, okay. it doesn't normally rain, uh, cause it's a, an out in the desolate middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is different that has additional effects in the game. When these elements are in effect, there are more moves that can happen, more things that can occur. And they provide you tips and guidelines for how your play should be going while that effect is out on the table. So these setting pieces are kind of like ways to both continue the story, but also it gives a little bit of difference compared to some other No Dice, No Master systems, such as yes. J-Dragon's Wander Home. It's kind of a way to bring a unique flair to your game. Right. Um, and so a lot of the No Dice, No Masters games have like a, have setting elements, and then they may have something else. So an, a source of inspiration for this game was also J-Dragon's Sleep Away, um, which I am incredibly impressed with, and I love to death, and I do not know if I could ever bring myself to play it, because it's far too terrifying. Yes. I just, I have read it th th three, four times, maybe four times now. And I'm constantly stunned by it. And it served as a main source of inspiration because it showed me that you could make this incredibly terrifying game where you, as a group, were telling each other terrifying stories to the point that they could break you. Yeah. Um, it's such good design and such a strong game. And I just thought, well, maybe I can do something like that. And maybe I have. I don't know. I'm no J-Dragon, but I am your <laughs> son. 
Van Heek. Uh, so the secondary part, and this is kind of similar to in Sleepaway, how there's the Lindworm. Uh, in this game, there's also the Desolation, which is the part of being out in the wastelands that is much more aggressively hostile to people, much okay. more likely to finish you off. And so um, those were the ones I kind of had the, the, the firmest handle on at the very beginning. So those were the ones I was talking with Juan about doing illustrations for. And so the first one was the segmented worm. And he drew this terrifying insectile worm thing. And uh, then, like, live while we were talking, he draws this thing. And it mod it's modified some, but what you see in that picture is essentially just the final version of the original sketch. It didn't even change very much. Jeez. It reminds me of, like, a T-Rex xenomorph. In like the it's, best way possible, right? It's so scary. It's so well done. It's so good, and and so we did all of those uh, desolation elements, and then I came back to him for the setting elements, and then I came back to him for the cover illustration, and then the character illustrations um, are actually by Osbod Alex Sorensen, who did all the illustration stuff in Electric Bastion Land. Have you seen that game? I haven't. It's incredibly beautiful, and it's it's a uh, it's <laughs> like you the the <laughs> whole core of the game is just the characters, and so there's like a hundred character archetypes in there, and each one has a full page illustration that he did, and they're all so beautiful. And I I looked at them and I said, this is this is kind of what I want my character art to look like. And he happened to be in a Discord I was in, and so I just messaged him and said, hey, could I get you to do some character art for me? And he <laughs> said, sure. Uh, and so I sent him briefs on those. And so uh, if you, at the Kickstarter page, you know, the um, the informant is there. Yes, I'm looking that, at it right now. Or, yeah, and that character is um, one of the six uh, character drawings that, that were done for me by Alec. And um, they were superb. We barely needed to... Often with art, there's a back and forth. Yeah. You know, you tell them what you're looking for. They send you a rough. You say, oh, all of this is wrong. They send you another rough while cursing silently. Um, <laughs> you know, the whole process. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but what happened here was he sent them back and I went, oh, these are all really good except for this one head. And he changed the head and then everything was fine. Uh, and so they went perfectly. And and now I get to commission three more because uh, the Kickstarter yeah. is ongoing right now. And my first three stretch goals were additional character roles. Yes. And so and I've already talked to Alec. And so he's going to be doing three more uh, character sketches. And I'm really excited because working with artists here has just been stupendous. Oh, that's great. We're going to talk a little bit more about characters in just a second. But just to give people a little bit more of a visual visualization of this game, can you tell me a little bit about the inspirations? Obviously, like, really quickly, this scratches yes. Mad Max Fury Road and Dark Sun setting. Like, yep. It, yep. Beautiful desert landscape. Can you tell me about some of the inspirations? And maybe some of the other themes that roll over that is more than just, it's a desert. Right. So there are, um, I really love Fury Road. I love Fury Road to death. It's a spectacular film. Um, and it, I, I had a whole series of, of tweets about how you could kind of model Fury Road partially in this game. Fury Road in the end turns out to have kind of some hope, which this game really doesn't have a lot of. So you'd have to play around with that a little, but... Um, one of the things is that Fury Road is about this journey from people who are fleeing uh, one of the last civilized places and trying to go to an imaginary place, not quite imaginary, but close enough, yeah, that well, they dream is somewhere out there. And so on, they're on this journey facing hardships, and that's part of the core element here. And you have people in the form of Nux, Furiosa, even the, the wives and um, and Max, although his story is slightly different, um, who are who have been part of 
bad regimes to one mm-hmm. degree or another who have been part of those power structures of evil and have to figure out if they can be better. Now, because it's a movie and they're the heroes, the deck is stacked slightly in their favor, but it's essentially the same kind of narrative. And the stark beauty of everything in Fury Road is definitely a strong inspiration. Dark Sun. So I played Dark Sun a few times when I was much younger. Like I said, I've I've been doing this for like 40 some years. And so I played Dark Sun when Dark Sun was new. And I always really loved it. And I loved the idea of it. And so when I was thinking about this game, even before Fury Road came in, the core concept was going to be instead of a sorcerer king, there would be a witch queen, but there would be just one of them and she would be dead. (laughs) And then what do you do in that world when all those sorcerer kings are gone? Like, how how is their life? How do you sustain anything? And you don't. Um, there's just, there's no way without those enormous sources of power. And so like the, the brutality and the emptiness and the, the potential for things to have been there is always kind of in the forefront of my mind. Then there's some other things that served as inspirations to one degree or another. The, the visual depiction of the capital in the Hunger Games movies. So, you know, these these cruel, thoughtless, um, baroque, extravagant people carelessly living their lives in such a way that it destroys everyone around them. Mm. Um, That's where the character role ideals kind of came from, is the fact of... Yeah, the fact of these capital people and, and everyone else in town in this one city of home was effectively, you know, the district residents. But... Just these indolent, sybaritic, horrible, monstrous beings lording it over everyone else. And then what suddenly happens when, you know, their entire system dies? How are these people functional in the actual system of Mad Max Fury Road or or Dark Sun? How, How do these people who have been powerful and cared for cope? Can they? And that's another part of the sort of question, like, do you try to enforce your power on the the caravan around you? And if you do, do they eventually turn on you and kill you all? That's that's something you're going to have to figure out at your table. But it's definitely there that there's now not this like solidity to their power that they had when there was a witch queen still. Yeah, those are the major ones. Yeah, yeah characters they're um arguably the biggest part for tabletop role players when they come in especially ones in no dice no masters those options yeah. are super important um, they are. some games have certain archetypes these kind of take a different spin um you've got the witchling and like the technocrat for example who yep. who do their own thing and we've talked a little bit about how these people were more or less powerful people within uh, this broken society. Yes. How exactly do these roles help establish them in the game? Right. So each of them comes equipped with like a pre-existing sort of situation as to how they related to the structures of power within the city. So the witchling is a former apprentice of the witch queen. The witchling has some magic. The witchling knows some secrets, but the witchling is also terrified of everything because oh. at any point, <laughs> at any point, the witch queen could just go, Oh, you, you know too much now and destroy them. Um, there was no, for all that they could be viewed as very, very powerful by ordinary people. They were nothing. And, they are fully aware of that nothingness. And so there's like an emptiness inside the witchling, for instance, that all their enormous power, as other people perceive it, is nothing. It's meaningless. It's a few parlor tricks. Um, And so each of the character roles has a similar situation, a way they related to the government, but also a way that that has left them broken and empty. 
And then each of them will also have what's called a deep wickedness, which is... Yes, I love the deep wickedness system. I love it so much. (laughs) Their way of... Thank you. Which is kind of their way of how they most often reacted to the world around them. What was their... What was kind of their go-to version of being bad? Um, And as they go through... As the characters go through their, their journey in strange hills they're going to run into moments and some of these are forced by moves that some of the characters have um but most of it's just narrative and they're going to run into moments where they have a clock that they'll be filling and it's whenever they have to have a moment where they decide am i going to give into my wickedness or am i not am i going to be incredibly violent right now or am I going to hold off and think better of things and as they go they tick this clock off and when the clock fills they enter a ritual process Uh, sleep away has rituals for instance many um, no dice no masters games have rituals moments that take you out of the regular rules of the game yeah and yeah and instead allow you to have uh a specific set of rules and a specific order for doing something. And in this case, the ritual is catharsis Mm -hmm. where you have a moment to think about all that you were and then relate it to the experiences you've had on the journey that have filled up your clock, which you've been making little notes of as you filled up the clock. And then you take a moment to discuss all of this with the other players. You're having a breakdown, which in Mad Max Fury Road, when Furiosa and the rest of them, but Furiosa is the one we're concerned with here, when they get to the green place and there isn't one anymore, and she goes out into the sands and just screams and screams and screams, that is roughly the equivalent of the ritual of catharsis. She has reached her breaking point, and she doesn't know which path to take in her life. Does she continue as she was, or does she change to become something new? And that is a choice you get to make when you go through catharsis. You don't have to just say, oh, I'm a better person now. You can always refuse to change. You can always double down on the fact that you're you're bad. Um, and, <laughs> and then you start that cycle again because your chances of redemption are never over. You just can continue to refuse. If you do go through catharsis and you do say, no, I'm going to become a better person, you actually get rid of some of the moves on your character and replace them with new moves because you're a different person now. Um, Each role has uh, three moves that you'll cross off when they, if you go through catharsis and decide that you're going to become a better person and you replace them with three moves from the catharsis ritual because you have changed. Um, then also the desolation elements like the segmented worm each of those Mm -hmm. is associated with a deep wickedness so the first time those come into play anyone who has the matching deep wickedness has to check a box automatically Um, and it's they have to kind of reflect for a moment on why does this speak to me how is this touching my emptiness what is going on here (laughs) Um, so that those desolation elements, in addition to being just generally unpleasant, also touch on your characters and make them make certain characters interact with certain elements. That's a really cool system. Everything's kind of tied in together. I love it. It's you know it's it is one that involved that requires a lot of investment from people, which is. Pretty much true for all No Dice, No Masters, but I feel like the darker they are, the more you have to be invested. Yes, I agree. How frequently do you think players are going to be interacting with this system? Um, which, which system, specifically? Like the, 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 the Deep, deep Witness kind of and thing? Catharsis systems. How, how frequently do you think they're going to be touching on that? I, I think that it's going to come up pretty regularly because... One of the whole points of the game, of course, the core element is, do you change? Do you become better? And that is reflected through your deep wickedness clock 
and the catharsis ritual. So you should be having these moments regularly where you're ticking something into your clock, where you're either choosing to lean into your wickedness or choosing to avoid it. And you should be conscious of that. You should be thinking all the time, is this towards or away from my worst self? There'll be plenty of moments where, you know, it's not meaningful. If, you're, if your wickedness is despair um, and, and you're having like a big fight with some of the, the caravan people where you're shouting at them to get them to do your will, it's not really relevant, you know? Yeah. But... But if, for instance, they entirely refuse you, deny you, and mock you, then maybe you think, oh, am I, am I useless? Is everything I had lost? I, I can't even get, you know, these, these poor townsfolk to, to do my will. Um, so maybe that's a moment for you to think about. And that, as with all No Dice, No Masters games, that's going to be something that you're going to talk about and the group is going to talk about when that moment comes. And it sh should come up really regularly. Um, when you're talking about this game, much like Sleep Away, for instance, I don't think it's a game that is designed for, for instance, campaign play. This is a game for one-shots or short arcs where you're going to be playing a handful of sessions. Yeah. Because you kind of have a number of built-in endpoints. Uh, either everyone can destroy each other uh, which could happen. Or at some point, you as a group, and this is another one of the rituals, um, mm -hmm. you as a group may decide that you're just done, that the journey has gone as far as it can go, that you're staring out over a strange vista and realizing there's nothing to be found. And that is, then there's a ritual for that moment when everyone is like, I think this is over. And, and you embrace that moment and you think about it and you reflect on it and you discuss it it's a it's a post-mortem for your game really it's a little dark and beautiful i really like <laughs> that actually yeah i i can be kind of uh, melancholy at the best of times <laughs> <laughs> i love i love melancholy things i love the feeling of of sadness wrapped up with satisfaction or happiness Mm -hmm. um, you know, that feeling that comes when you're ending a really great campaign or yeah. that feeling that happens when your character dies in the fourth session of the game and you know you're just going to make another one, but you still get to feel like, oh, darn, Baba Booey is gone now. You know, like <laughs> I, I liked him. He was good. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll make a ranger now because we, we need that. Um, so... <laughs> I like those feelings where you're thinking about how good a time was and and then thinking also about how it's ended. Mm -hmm. um, endings are real important. And I think yeah. that I think that a lot of people don't think enough about endings. Most tabletop games don't really involve the idea of endings. No. You know? No, they don't. If you're playing D D, if you're playing um you know, stars without number. There isn't an ending built in. Y your game will end at some point, in theory. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are those yep. people who've been playing for like 40 years, but <laughs> in theory, that one campaign, and they're still only eighth level. How does this happen? Uh, <laughs> but at some point, your game is going to end, but it's not ending in the same, like, capital E. It's just ending. Yes. You know? Yeah. And for a lot of people now, you know, with scheduling and, and everything else, often they don't even end. You just kind of, after you miss four sessions, everyone's just like, well, I guess we're not playing this anymore. Yeah. Indefinite hiatus. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, two years down the line, someone says, remember how we had that one game? I think everyone has more time now. Let's try and schedule something, which doesn't happen. And then, you know, no, your never does. <laughs> So let's take a quick step back from Strange Hills as a game and talk about something that I love talking about, especially with ongoing Kickstarters. Your Kickstarter has done very well for what you asked for. You've hit three stretch goals. Can you tell me about your Kickstarter experience so far? 
I can. So, um, so there's a few things that I, I, I talked to a lot of people who had run Kickstarters before. Uh, okay. And I listened to some of the things they said, and I didn't listen to others. Uh, and next time I'll <laughs> listen to more. Uh, of course, every Kickstarter is different, right? Even mm-hmm. Kickstarters that are roughly your goal and roughly your scope and so on, they're, they're going to handle yeah. differently. But the main thing that I learned very quickly, and, and it's come up, in fact, during this, this very talk, uh, is the art. So yes. you... It behooves you to assume that you're going to spend a lot of money on art before your Kickstarter, and then your goals are generally there to try and get that art, rather than buy it. I think it works better that way than to buy a couple pieces just so your Kickstarter page looks good, and then think you're going to buy a whole lot later on. Because if you can load your page with a bunch of art that looks good, it's really going to (laughs) help. Yes, it is. That is a very reoccurring statement on this podcast. (laughs) Right? Get that (laughs) art. Get it. Um, And, you know, if your goals are very modest, you can also have very modest art. But yeah, it's really tough to... I mean, if if you're going to ask for 150 bucks because you're going to put a PDF of a two-page thing up on drive-thru, great, more power to you, have whatever art but if you're looking for a print if you're looking for anything serious get that art get it quick get your artists lined up beg them for for an opening in their in their time um that was a really key thing um secondly your your description super important run that by anyone you know Get your grammar checked out. Get your spelling checked out. Have people look over the sections, the spacing. Um, You want it to be appealing. And appealing layout and design is harder than a lot of people imagine. And so show it off to people and have them just tell you, oh, no, that looks terrible. There's all sorts of limitations because <laughs> Kickstarter has like, you know, predetermined parameters. You can't do everything with it, but you can make it look pretty good, especially if you paid for that great art. Um, exactly. And then um, be ready to engage. You, you need to, even if you're not, you know, moving a lot, even if your your success level isn't very strong, you still need to be out there promoting it. Not quite nonstop, because that can make some people crabby, but pretty strongly. You need to have at least a daily boost, and you need to be ready when you're in the middle of the Kickstarter to have, you know, one person back it on your second Tuesday. Because the middle of your campaign can be real slow. Yeah. And I've seen a couple things. When you're talking about boosting, I've seen a couple things about Strange Hills through other... I, I saw, I believe it was like an online magazine interview with Dice you or dice breaker yes dice breaker is yeah. huge i love dice breaker um yeah they 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 caught it up and um did a nice little bit about it that also showed off some of the art which made me really happy because <laughs> i'm glad to hear it it's my selling point <laughs> i mean it's a good game it's a good game but you have to read the game you can just see a piece of the art and go yes um i mean you get that new tabletop role-playing game book you're not reading the rules but you're thumbing through that looking at the pictures so yeah. like i i feel like that's a pretty common uh, at least mm-hmm. every game i've gotten that's what i do first yep. so very first thing you just flip through idly just examining things like um you mentioned wander home earlier and i got my wander home print copy last week Ooh, and i just you. it's so beautiful it's so it looks very pretty, so beautiful, and um, you know I haven't read any of the rules, but I flipped through it twice already <laughs> just to <laughs> look at the art, and the layout's really amazing. Also, all the design yes. is so good; um, it's just top notch. And someday I could dream of being there, maybe like three or four Kickstarters down the road. <laughs> this one will be good. I also have uh, so um, also related to artists. Uh, so I have my graphic designer. Um, Guantijo, Guantijo, is um, he's Brazilian and he did my little banner that says you know funded in twenty four hours, put it together with uh, 
the cover art and that, and he did the the book mock-up that is on the page. Yes. And he's uh, he's a gamer, and he writes his own games, but he's also an incredible layout and graphic design person. And so he's one of my stretch goals. So uh, at four thousand dollars, I'll be able to hire him. And um, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. And once that happens, I get to turn over my acceptable but not thrilling efforts <laughs> and say, here, make this look spectacular. And then on Twitter, everyone can be opening my book like it was Wander Home. Um, <laughs> I almost accidentally rained on your parade because I'm looking at it in Canadian dollars. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I was right. Like, what do you mean? You just passed 4,000. But <laughs> no, no, I'm just very sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, and he was, he's another find that I've made uh, through talking to people and, and being on discords. And one of the things that I have noticed a lot with people who are making their own games is they're often really terrified to contact artists. Have you heard that a lot from people? I I hear it so frequently. Yeah. Like, it's almost sad how often, because there's so many great ideas, but people are nervous. And the, I, I can, now that I'm here, I can state, just send them a message. They're usually incredibly nice. If they are open for commissions, they will tell you and they will work with you. And everyone I have worked with has been an absolute treat and a peach of a human being. And I just cannot recommend highly enough just sending that message. If you are someone at home right now thinking, I wish I had some art, that person who you saw on Twitter, send them that message. They will love to work with you. Do it. Just go, go, go out and ask that artist for some help. And just literally say, hey, I'm looking for like six pieces of art in your style. They're going to be terrain pieces with small characters in the front. Can we do that? Really brief message. They'll get back to you and they'll ask you more questions. You don't need to be fully prepared for the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> you can just say, I want six landscapes and one of them should have a guy with a sword in it. And then you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, while we're still on the Kickstarter, uh, I know that yeah. I talked to you a little bit about it, but right at the bottom, you have a land acknowledgement. People who have been listening for a little while know that these kind of things are really important to me. Um, and I just wanted to ask right out here, why did you, um, why did you think it was important to put this right on the Kickstarter? Because I, I've seen it in books. But I think mm -hmm. this is the first I've outright seen on a Kickstarter page outside of Coyote and Crow, but that is a very different story. Right. They, they had a very specific, um, I mean, that's a very specific message and, and mode I'm and message. I'm so excited for it. For Coyote and Crow. So that's like a, uh, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of the whole project there. Exactly. And so um, the reason why, I do them is um, a few years ago, I was working at a natural history museum here in Seattle, uh, okay. the Berkeley Museum of Natural History. And oh, okay. both the University of Washington, which it's part of, and the Burke Museum were working on their land acknowledgement statements. And um, I ended up on the DEIAC diversity equity equality uh the, there's a whole lot of different acronyms but yes um, effectively the inclusion and diversity committee um and we spent some time going over some of the drafts for it there but more importantly um there were several indigenous staff members on the committee and they really uh made clear to me uh, exactly how important it is to acknowledge and be aware of these things and so I have made an effort to put them in anything that I'm working on now uh, to have them put in for a not. I was working with a nonprofit writing group for a while and pushing them very strongly to put one on, but they were nervous about it. Um, 
I have a question for you. So yeah. one of the things that I wonder about, because people tell me this, um, is people have told me, oh, I would like to do that, but I'm too nervous. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to do it wrong and people will get mad at me. And uh, I, I don't really... <laughs> <laughs> uh, from my perspective, I think, well, you're making a good faith effort and someone's going to tell you if you did it wrong yes. and then you can make it right. Um, yeah. but there's plenty of land acknowledgement statements from institutions all around the world mm -hmm. that can give you a format for how you want to phrase it. And then you can make it a little personal to your, yourself. And of course your location, you need to know. Yes which indigenous peoples you're settling the land of and, and you need to acknowledge your, the fact that you're a settler on land that isn't yours. And so that's what I try to do. Um, specifically, you know, my, my, my current house right now where I'm talking to you uh, is, is on the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, a lot of uh, native peoples did not have a fixed home you know they they drifted around a large area and so there's about five different tribes that that were regularly in the area i'm in um the duwamish the muckleshoot the puyallup the snohomish and the um sometimes even the tulalip and specifically though the land that i'm on is most commonly associated with the duwamish people who are a federally unrecognized tribe in the United States. They were briefly federally recognized for a couple of years, and then it was reversed. And um, they have a really great organization set up, uh, Real Rent Duwamish, where you can go to their website and sign up to pay them rent. Uh, whatever monthly amount you want, it's a monthly payment that goes directly to the tribe. It's processed by a nonprofit, so there's no overhead for them. Everything just goes directly there. And I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And I wish I'd known about it earlier because I would have started sooner. Um, but I feel like it's really important to be aware of whose land you're occupying and who those people are today, not who they were, as it's often taught in the United States, who they were. That's it. Like in the United States, it's often this idea that all native peoples are gone or if yeah. they're not they just they work at the casino those are the two options there's mm -hmm. no other and it's it's ridiculous and stupid and <laughs> learn like at least learn whose land you're on at least acknowledge it mm -hmm. canada's not exactly i can't say that canada did well uh i feel like most people have heard about the residential homes now um yeah so those are still going strong not the the homes but the, right. the discoveries the discoveries um, now that people most, are looking everywhere yes most of our reservations actually we're totally getting off this but you can listen to this for a second people because it's important to hear um, very important so most of our reservations actually fit into the smallest navajo reservation in the states so and that's like over the entirety of canada it's not good we have not treated them well yeah. at all um yeah so hopefully we get some rectification for that soon um but we're not going to get onto that we can definitely talk about more stuff like that down the line um and i'm sorry if you hear this and you didn't like that go, go to a different podcast <laughs> that's just plain and simple <laughs> um yeah, i mean First off, it's, yeah. it, it's 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 your podcast, so yeah, exactly. It's my podcast. I can do what I want. If, if this is your topic. This is your topic. We are talking. About. Let's go. Um, and it's relevant to my Kickstarter, and exactly. it's going to be in the credits page on the book. And mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 going to be there. And so, you know, it's, it's <laughs> it is it is game material. It also it works thematically for your caravans and stuff too so it really does um because they're they're traveling through uh lands and they they don't know whose lands they are or yeah, exactly were. in this case it's literally were. um yeah <laughs> um so 
Yeah, continue, please. So, uh, at, at the time of this recording, uh, there's about 10 days left on the Kickstarter, but at the time it comes out, there's going to be about three days left. So we're going to be entering the final stretch, uh, which is an exciting time again, because suddenly mm-hmm. all the people who said, remind me, have been reminded. Um, yes. And I don't know if, I don't know about you, but I have been that guy on many, many Kickstarters now where they go, two days left. And I'm like, oh, wait, where's my credit card? What's, yeah, I have to, <laughs> I'm back. In. I forgot I all about you. Um, so I'm hoping that, that I have a lot of people who, Some of that when Kickstarter through, yeah. says, Hey, not much time left. They're going, oh, right. This thing. <laughs> Gotta get it. Um, I I also look forward to maybe there's a few more elements that can be added to the game that might end up getting uh, more art put in if that happens. And so that's also something I look forward to. Um, actually, my very next stretch goal, which is which I'm like $60 US from, is paying my artists a little more money. I saw that. I really like that one. I always want to, so I'm looking at this game as effectively a loss leader. Like I want to make more games. I want to be a, you know, tiny Mm -hmm. paid game designer. Right. And so I'm thinking of it like opening a business. Like, you know, they tell you when you open a small business, you should really plan for a year or two where you don't make any money. You got to just kind of live off your savings and, and kind of hope to break even. But while you're doing that, you're building a business and you're also employing other people. And so you're providing some funds for other people and you're, you're hopefully building some sort of community based on your business and, you know, things like that. And I want to do all of that. And so right now I have the means up front at the moment where I can pay some artists um, and, and get a bunch of art and then hopefully turn around and reach like a break even point for me which is fine. But then on the next one, make a little more money and pay my artists a little more money and make maybe a tiny profit and so on and so forth as, as we go along, because you, it's, it's fine for that process to be like, Oh, I made some money, but everyone involved should be coming out of it financially recompensed at an appropriate level. You need to pay your people super important that is very important um so yeah that's that's the goal is to produce more games after this like i think uh not too long ago you had brian short on is that right? yes brian brian trout see i've never Can I say that? I, we're only online friends i've never seen i've never actually heard his yeah. last name spoken no brian, um, brian short you're right i've been misreading it for literally weeks oh my gosh okay. brian i'm so sorry i know you're listening huh. to this i'm sorry <laughs> so we are working on a game together actually right now oh um that is another no dice no masters game about uh well i'm not gonna say too much about it because it's later on but I that might be the next later, so <laughs> that might be the next kickstarter um maybe like early next year because we we have like i in fact right here do you hear this paper oh i do hear that paper that that is a printout of the 36 pages we currently have that I'm going to be going over and Brian is going over his version of it um, so that we can get started. And we've already commissioned some art for this one from Wanachoa again because you got to get that art. Oh, I entirely forgot to mention some of the things with the art. I'm going back to art. Yeah. <laughs> some of the things that with the art, like I was telling people things and they brought me back art that showed me things about the game I hadn't known. Because what I gave to them, planted into their brain, grew these new seeds. Like, when I had originally put together the concept, it was leaning very hard towards Dark Sun. So it was a very fantasy-based game. And then, during a sketch session, Juan drew a VW bus as part of it. And I thought, oh, heck, now it's any era. Like, you can put it wherever you want. And now there's art in it that supports a bunch of different eras, that supports a present and a slight weird future and a fantasy and a post-apocalyptic and all sorts of different things. So there's still a mood, but you can customize it a little. Like, do you feel like there should be, like, I should be leaving home in a tank? 
Okay, you can do that. Do you, is, is that your vehicle as you leave? Great. Um, that's for your group to decide. But now there's art that supports that. And I hadn't even considered the possibility until I was getting pieces back from the artists. So your artists, even if they're not formally like on the team, you know, if they're contract artists instead of your in-house artists, they're still going to build your game for you by making your brain think of things you hadn't, as long as you're open to it. You don't want to have a, a situation where you're like, nah, that, I don't want any of that. I, I gave you an exact brief, give me exactly that back. Let them help you build your game. You've given a, a lot of really good advice for this. I'm actually <laughs> going to go over that question because a lot of this has been really good. So I want to just hit this up as a summary. So pay your artists yeah. well, acknowledge yeah. the people, yeah, accept criticism. Like You've hit yeah. all those blocks, and I think a lot of people will take away from that uh, in this one. Um, we're actually kind of run down the wire. I just looked and I haven't right. really been paying attention. <laughs> it's like, but we've been going for over 50 minutes now. Right. Um, so it's been a bit, <laughs> it's been a little bit. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I hope it was listeners really have too. It's been a great I, conversation. And I'm so happy you had me on. This has been yeah, it's spectacular. Been just <laughs> I, you're, you're very good at just nudging. Oh, I love a good nudge. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jason, where can people find more about you and Strange Hill, upcoming projects? Where can people find that stuff? You know, uh, it's really mostly on my Twitter, which is on um, the Kickstarter page. So it's it's yes. just Strange Hills, Jason Van He. It's, um, it's really easy to find. And um, I had a web page, but it kind of was really not good. So I'm looking to get a new web page uh shortly but the person i want to do it see this is why you need to contact your people early the person i want to do it <laughs> is super busy right now because i didn't send that message soon enough ah, i didn't just knuckle down and say i want you to build me a website at the first moment i thought of it i paused i hemmed i hawed and then he said oh i have this really big project going on for the next month and i was like oh but it'll come soon and in this short follow up after the Kickstarter, there should be more information. I'm doing a lot of updates there, and I will continue to do so as we go along. As always, listeners, the links for Jason and Strange Hills, they're going to be down below. And as new things start to come out for it, those links are going to get updated in episodes. So if you're listening to this five months from now, for whatever reason, uh, hopefully you are, uh, there will be an updated version to those links. Well, they're listening to it five months from now because Brian and I will have been on. So they're going to want to listen to both our previous episodes. Yes, I would. <laughs> I, I'm hoping for that. I'm, I'm always down for that. I love having multiple people on the show at the same time, especially I, I love the idea of bringing people back. Jason, it has been so much fun. Thank you so this much. This was so good. The show. Thank you yeah, for it was having great. me. Um, I, I love talking about it. I'm very excited for Strange Hills. And audience, thank too. you so Yeah, you better be. You put a lot of work <laughs> into this. I did. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening, audience. Jason and Strange Hills, they're scheduled to launch very soon. Kickstarter, you only got like three days. If you're listening to this late, you got less than that. So go back them right now. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you so much to Jason for coming onto the show this week. The conversation we had meant a lot to me, and I think a lot of people could hear that with how later focused I ended up being. Strange Hills Kickstarter is coming to a close, and you only have until September 9th of 2021 to go back it, so please do that. Jason's a wonderful person, and Strange Hills has already reached its goal. You have nothing to worry about with this game failing. It looks incredible. Go give him and his team a, a look and just see how great this game is. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in, listeners. I should probably start trying to come up with some sort of name to identify you all, because 
listeners it's really impersonal and you're all too wonderful for that at this point this has been the 21st episode of scheduled for launch and it's getting busy we are incredibly close to having 500 downloads and at this point it's it's absolutely astonishing i can't believe we've gotten here if you are a creator who has reached out to me and hasn't heard back i am so sorry this past week has been absolutely wild and i got a lot of messages i hear you i promise i will get back to you very soon if you like this episode and you want to hear more though please share it with a friend or somebody who you think would enjoy the show word of mouth is the best thing that you can do to spread awareness for it and if you haven't already please consider giving it a review on your listening app of choice if you can't do that also totally fine Next week, I have the wonderful Ethan H. Reynolds coming on the show to talk about Neon Knights. I think you're all going to really like that. It's a cyberpunk, just wild world, and I'm so excited to show you all. Until next time, though, bye, take care. <laughs>